Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's Bible study, looking at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 to 21. This is the reading that we looked at on Sunday, and Miles gave us seven things that we see in this passage that enable us to see what God is doing at the moment. Now, this comes from the book of Isaiah, and like Elijah and Jeremiah and the other prophets, Isaiah was called to be a messenger for God and speak to the people of Israel on his behalf. Now, a lot of this book is taken up with warnings to Israel about the way they're living and the impending judgment that is about to come to them because of their sin. But also in this mess, in this book is a message of hope. Now, Miles began on Sunday by looking at how prophecy works in the Bible, how it sort of looks back, looks imminently forward, and then looks beyond that to Jesus, and then beyond that to the return of Jesus. You could call this a prophetic mountain range. And in the book of Isaiah, uh, that's where he's sort of located there on the X, he looks back firstly to the exodus from Egypt where God brought the people out of Egypt. He then looks forward to when they're going to return from exile. So he says, yep, the Babylonians are going to come. They're going to take you away, but you're going to come back. But then he looks beyond that to this third mountain, which is the work of Jesus. And then beyond that to the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus. And we are sort of here ish somewhere between Jesus's first coming and his second coming we don't know exactly where we are uh, but that's the promise that when Jesus will come back not in humility but in glory so the context of our reading uh, before we look at those seven things is that that this is a, a is a, a passage that is going to look back and then it's going to look forwards uh, in many different ways and you can uh, look at this and understand this in a few different uh, uh, few different ways. Um, that's the context for our reading and we're going to look at those seven things. But before we get to that, uh, let's take the time uh, to look at the passage for ourselves. So one of your group uh, read it out aloud. Everyone else have it open in front of them and then mark the passage as you go with an exclamation mark for anything you notice, a question mark with any questions you have, and an arrow for anything you see that the passage is telling you to do. Pause the video now, do that, and see you back in a bit. So our reading starts with God giving us his CV. That's what verses 16 to 17 are about. At a job interview, you might get asked uh, some questions uh, like these to find out who you are. And God wants them to know who they are dealing with. He wants us to know who they're dealing with. So he lays it all out. Tell me an achievement that you're proud of. Describe your character under 50 words. Sure thing. This is 46 words that explain who God is. So he starts with talking about uh, looking back to the Exodus and it says he, he is the Lord who made a path through the sea. Like that's power. Like water is powerful. Like that's a feat today it, with modern engineering to make a pathway through the sea. We also, he uh, boasts of uh, being the one who drew the chariots and the horses out uh, and put them at the bottom of the sea, never to rise again. Like horses are pretty fierce. Like this is the household cavalry. They used to ride around uh, where we used to live in London and you don't want to get in their way. Uh, but do you know what? The, the household cavalry, they are now an armoured division. Uh, when uh, you hear them talking about horses, this is kind of, you know, it's basically the modern day equivalent of a tank. Uh, this is what you should think of uh, that the Israelites are talking about. And the Lord defeated them. He puts them at the bottom of the ocean. That's the uh, Exodus story. It's really powerful imagery. You know, for the Israelites, the horsemen represented every fear in their life. Slavery, oppression, death. Like, I wonder what's the cavalry in your life. Maybe it's bills to pay, uh, a visa that needs to be renewed and you're having problems with. Maybe it's yourself or, or your own sin or diary management or sickness or war. God starts by reminding them that there has been a past victory in their lives. And in the past, he won the greatest victory beyond what they could have ever imagined. So let's start with there. Let's start. God comes with his CV. Uh, I wonder what's God's CV in your life. Question one is, when has God broken through for you? Think of a time when things looked really bleak and God broke through. Start by taking a, a moment to think for yourself, maybe a minute. 
give the introverts a moment to uh, uh, think through uh, and then take uh, some time to share with the group uh, a time when God has broken through for you. Verse 17 then uh, finishes in this really interesting way, changes the imagery uh, from talking about the Exodus story of uh, putting the uh, uh, Egyptian army at the bottom of the ocean. And he says, they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. It is a really interesting piece of imagery because a candle flame, once snuffed out, can continue to smolder. Our enemies are defeated, but they're not all destroyed yet. Uh, And so when he says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. He, he's saying because it's very easy for us to do that. We, we see the smoke of our enemies and we think, oh, they're coming back. Uh, and he's saying, no, no, you don't have to worry and you need to stop thinking about the former things. Do not dwell in the past. If you like, time travel is possible. You can live in the past. You do this by considering ancient things, as the text literally says. But our past does not have to forge our future. So Isaiah says, instead, replace your unhelpful thinking, your considering the uh, past, with what God is doing now. And here are seven ways that you can do that. Number one, be aware that it is God who is doing a new thing. See, I am doing a new thing. As with the Exodus, this is something God is doing. He's not going to say you're going to be doing a new thing or we're going to be doing a new thing. But see, I am doing a new thing. And that's number one. The second thing that allows us to see with hope is this, that things can change suddenly. It's been said that God seems to have two speeds, slowly and suddenly. He says now it springs up. They've been in a desert time, but now this thing God is doing is going to suddenly come. The third thing we see is that he says to us, do you not perceive it? In other words, we have to look with eyes of faith because it is possible to miss this. Do you not perceive it? It's a really key question for us. This is sort of the principle of seek and you will find. In the negative, if you're looking for an excuse, you will always find one. But if you're looking for what God is doing, you will always eventually be able to see what he is doing and how he's at work in your life. Seek and you will find. Do you see or do you not perceive it? Look with eyes of faith. So, Second question for tonight is, where do you find it hardest to see with eyes of faith? Where do you find it hardest to see with eyes of faith? And um, if you've got some post-it notes, maybe you want to write down some locations or situations or, or people that when you're with, you find it hard to see with eyes of faith. And then maybe grab a different colored post-it note. And on that one, write, what are the things you have Uh, you you struggle to have faith for. Uh, Maybe it's uh, for healing or seeing someone come to faith or a situation change or uh, a dynamic with uh, somebody in your life to actually change, to be uh, uh, more fruitful and more good. And then thirdly is um, I'd love you to consider what would it look like for God to have victory in that area? What could it look like for God to have victory uh, in that area? Because it isn't always what we expect. Uh, uh, Just think of those three things. uh, A situation where you find it hard to see with eyes of faith. Something you find it hard to have faith for. uh, And uh, what could it look like for God uh, to bring about his victory in that place? Uh, Write that down and then share that with each other. The fourth and fifth thing this passage say regarding what God is doing, uh, kind of uh, look at the unexpected nature of the way God works. Uh, Hope springs up in the wilderness. Uh, See, again, I am, not us, but I am. God is making a way in the wilderness. Uh, He is making streams in the wasteland. The wilderness is a picture of our condition, that we are out of the land of slavery. God has delivered us. He set us free from slavery to sin, but we still have struggles. Uh, We are still not yet in the promised land. Uh, We are in the wilderness, if you like. But God is at work there. It's unexpected. But also, it's not just that he works in unexpected places, Is he works with unexpected people, i.e., This is for everyone. He says the wild animals honour me, the jackals and the owls. 
Both are creatures of the night. Uh, the owl, according to the fluid laws, is unclean uh, to the Jewish people. And I'm not sure about the jackals, but either way, I bet they're not that tasty. Uh, God says hope comes in unexpected places, but also to unexpected people. This is not only for everyone, but it's also for everyone everywhere. None of us are excluded. Uh, the places that we just listed in our discussion time, those are our wilderness. And yet God promises to do a new thing there. He promises uh, to do these next two things. First of all, he promises uh, to give drink to my people, to give drink to my people. He gives us water. Uh, and Jesus picks up that imagery in, in John's gospel. Anyone who's thirsty, come to me. And the purpose of giving us water in the wilderness is that the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. The purpose of this is worship. God gives us what we need, whatever it is, whatever you're thirsty for, God promises to satisfy that desire. Not always by just giving us what the thing you want uh, exactly, but sometimes he does that, but more importantly, he satisfies the deepest desires and needs that we have. And one of the reasons he does that is so that we can worship him and give him the praise that we're due, which is which is brilliant because that is not only uh, what we're uh, created to do. That's the water we desire uh, because we are designed to give glory. We are designed to give glory to God and he makes it possible for us to worship him even in the wilderness. Now, as Miles said on Sunday, sometimes we can we can feel that we can't come to Jesus because of the problems in our life. Uh, and he said some advice he was given when he felt that way is don't let what is wrong with you stop you from worshipping what is right with him. God makes it possible for us to worship him even in the wilderness. And one of the amazing thing is that as we worship him, we start to discover that he puts the things right that are out of place in our life. Worship is not only just uh, what he sets us free to do, it's one of the things that we deep down desire to do. Uh, and so as he gives us that water and he enables us to praise, we find ourselves satisfied as we worship him. So those are seven things. And, uh, and where that is going to land for us tonight is uh, the question I want to ask is, what does it look like? to worship Jesus in the place of your will, will <laughs> in the place of your weakness and wilderness i tried to join both words there today a wilderness uh, but uh, what is the place what does it look like to worship Jesus in the place of your weakness and your wilderness i i don't know maybe you struggle with anger and it comes out in a particular situation with certain people. What would it look like to worship Jesus and have hope that you can be different in that situation? Now, I'm going to suggest that worshipping Jesus, maybe if it's in a meeting in a work context, is not to get out a guitar and start singing, but it's likely to be something else. Or, or uh, here, another example, a friend of uh, mine struggled with gossip in the workplace. And so he made it the practice that he always uh, avoided the meeting after the meeting. You know, the meeting after the meeting where people get together and they say what they really think. He always avoided that uh, and resolved to always say what he needed to say and what he meant to say in front of everyone rather than bringing different faces to different groups. So so something like that or, or something very different might be for you. Um, uh, but if you have hope, it means you act differently. If you have hope, it means you act differently. So what does it look like for you to have hope in your weakness and in your area of wilderness. Uh, and then maybe brainstorm that as a group. Uh, maybe just you want to pick one or two of the things people shared earlier uh, and work on that together. And maybe brainstorm some things that you can put into practice in the power of the Spirit tomorrow. So come up with some ideas and then pray about it. And then don't forget to pray for one another as you, uh, as you finish off tonight's discussion and go off into your weeks together. Have a great night. God bless.